It has been said that the greatest affirmation of the church is not the affirmation that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. It is not the affirmation that he performed incredible miracles or that he was a profound teacher or that he embodied the very presence of God. No, the greatest affirmation is that Jesus Christ is alive and that he actually lives inside the hearts and souls of every one of us here. That is the essential message of Easter. He lives. Christ lives. That is the essential message of our faith. The worship, we worship a living God. We worship a God who is still speaking, still working, still moving, still living. How can we make the message live vibrantly this morning and throughout the rest of the week? How can we, we help people realize that Jesus is alive within each of us and the presence of Christ can transform us? Today in our scripture lesson, we return to the evening of the first Easter where the disciples of Jesus are all huddled together. They're hiding in fear of what the authorities might do to them. Then, while they are in the middle of a conversation, the resurrected Jesus appears before them in the flesh. Jesus sees their startled and their terrified expressions, and he seeks to take away their fear and their doubt. He commands them to see the wounds he suffered, the wounds that he got on the cross, and to touch him so that they have no doubt that it is he, that it is he there in the flesh. And to reinforce the point that he is real flesh and blood, he eats some fish that they have prepared. Jesus then talks to them about God's plan as described in the scriptures. Jesus has fulfilled his role as Messiah as by his suffering and by his rising on the third day. And he tells them that they are a part of God's continuing plan of salvation for the world. He says that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And then Jesus says, you are my witnesses of these things. The disciples are witnesses not just in the sense that they have seen these things. They've seen these things happen, but they are also to proclaim what they have witnessed to the world. But Jesus is not talking to the first disciples only those who lived 2,000 years ago. No, he's speaking to each and every one of us here and now. He commands each one of us to share our witness to the world that Christ is alive and the living God is still speaking. But I suspect that some of us may have a problem with that command to witness beyond the embarrassment or the fear of talking about something personal with someone else. Some of us have some strong doubts about Jesus rising from the dead and that he is still alive today. I certainly do not have the time in this sermon to consider every kind of evidence for the resurrection. But I am also uh, not going to just demand that you accept it as fact because the Bible tells you so. I want to present what I consider the most compelling evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, his disciples. When you read the gospel stories, you will be amazed how much the followers of Jesus do not come across very favorably. They are described as petty, selfish, quarrelsome, and sometimes just downright stupid. Up until the death of Jesus on the cross, the disciples' understanding of Jesus is that he is their meal ticket to social and financial prosperity. They think that Jesus is going to be crowned king of Israel, and that they are going to receive the fruit of his success by being so close to him. True to their character, when Jesus is arrested and tried, the disciples scatter. They flee in fear for their own lives. Even the bravest and boldest of the bunch, Simon Peter, denies that he ever knew Jesus. And when Jesus dies, the disciples all hide out in terror, fearing that they will be found. You wonder why Jesus chose these people to be his disciples, really. But something happened to these frightened, selfish, quarreling, and sometimes stupid disciples. They became changed. 
they became transformed into something else. The fearful became courageous. The selfish became self-denying. The disciples stopped hiding in fear and began to courageously proclaim in public. They went out into foreign lands, courageously proclaiming in public that Jesus Christ lives. They knew persecution and death lay ahead of them, but they continued to tell the story and demonstrate God's love. Eleven men are not going to give up their lives to simply perpetuate that which they know to be a hoax. All but one died a horrible and painful death, proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead. People do not die to perpetuate a lie or a fairy tale. How can we explain such a dramatic change and almost complete transformation of character? The resurrection of Jesus can explain it. If Jesus had simply died, they would have just gone back to their homes. They, they probably would have just tried out to live out the rest of their lives as well as they could. But they did not. They went out into the world, and they went throughout the world. They not only spoke the faith, they lived the faith. Take for, uh, also, for example, the Apostle Paul. To begin with, Paul persecuted the Christians, perhaps even killing some. But on the road to Damascus, something happened to him. Paul became a changed man who preached Christ rather than killing those who did. How could someone change from a vicious hater and a preacher of, uh, to a preacher of love if not for the touch of the risen Christ? And the real evidence of the resurrection of Jesus is a living proof, the living proof of lives that were forever changed. Something happened to the disciples and many others to radically change from, change them from fear to courage, from doubt to certainty, from selfishness to generosity, from defeat into victory. The spirits of the disciples had lain in the grave along with Jesus' dead body. But when they experienced, then they experienced something, something which brought them out of death and into life. What happened to them was the resurrection of the Lord. They experienced the resurrected Jesus. That experience changed their lives as it would change our lives too if we experienced it firsthand. The disciples became new people with new life and new power. But it was not just that Jesus was raised from the dead that changed them. More importantly, what changed them was why Jesus was raised from the dead. The first letter of John says, See what love God has given us that we should be called children of God. By the power of God's love, Jesus rose from the dead. By the death and resurrection of Jesus, God was showing us how much God loves us. What did Jesus do after being resurrected? Well, he went to the fearful and doubting disciples. He stood among them and he said to them, Peace be with you. Jesus does not seek revenge for them forsaking him. He does not even scold them for leaving him. What does he do? He calms their fears. By the power of God's love, Jesus has returned to reestablish his peaceful and loving relationship with them. God has, loved, God has loved us, he's loved the disciples, and in spite of their failings, in spite of our failings, he claims us all as children of God. Being a child of God is something that's given to us. It's a gift. The disciples, nor Paul, did anything to earn God's love. But God loved them just the same. Being a child of God is not a matter of resolving some intellectual dilemma. It is based more on the acceptance of a mystery rather than understanding a theological principle. Being a child of God is not a matter of earning it by good behavior. It is a matter of God loving us enough to reveal God's own self to us. Yet even though being a child of God is a gift, we still have to accept that gift in order to have the gift. Even though God gives us the title of progeny, we must come to accept it, to believe it for ourselves. 
In order to accept God's gift, we must come to believe that God loves us. We do not deserve that love or merit in any way, but it is ours to reject or to accept. And our acceptance of the gift says more about our belief in the goodness of God than in our worthiness of the gift. The true follower of Christ undergoes a change from his or her previous existence to their present life. The acceptance of God's gift transforms us from a child of the world to a child of God. And one of the signs that a person truly believes in Jesus is a changed life. What happens to everyone who truly meets the resurrected Christ is change. That's what happens. When you truly know in your heart that Jesus lives, you cannot be the same person that you were before. You can only remain the same when Jesus is an idea in your head and not a belief in your heart. If Jesus is just an idea, well, you may speak the faith, you may talk about it, but you do not live it. We are here today because so many people down through the ages and living today have been transformed by the presence of the living Christ in their lives. What the disciples experienced 2,000 years ago is something which people ever since have experienced and know in their hearts that Christ lives and that God loves them. They have experienced the resurrection for themselves. The disciples started something which lives on today in you and me, the Church of Jesus Christ. That's who we are gathered today, right here at this moment. They helped produce a book so that we could keep the story alive because it is the story of the good news that God lives and God loves us. The story that may be written in a book, but if it is not written in our hearts, it is just a nice story that entertains us or something we may study. If we know, however, in our hearts that Christ lives and God loves, well then, it's a story of life. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We embody God's love and grace. We embody new life. The disciples founded the church of Jesus Christ not by having Christ live with them, but having Christ live in them, just as Christ lives in us, or at least can live in us. The Apostle Paul said, It is not I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. Christ lives within us as well. The proof we have of Jesus' resurrection is a living proof. You and me. We are the living proof of God's victory over death. We are here because there is life and hope in our words and in our actions. The words have been handed down to us because they speak of a powerful experience which can change lives and give us something to live so fully and so well that we would be willing to die for it. We may not know much about the Bible. We may not be able to quote Scripture. We may not be able to make a great theological debate or argument. We may not convince people of the tenets of the creed. But we can share what we know from our own personal experience. We need to tell others how God in Jesus Christ has made a difference in our lives so God can make a difference in their lives. Jesus did not command the the whole world to go to church. What Jesus commanded was that his whole church would go to the world. We cannot expect the world to come to us and hear our story. We have to go out. We have to go out beyond these walls, into the world, to share the good news about what we have witnessed in our own lives about God's goodness. We are the living proof that Jesus is not dead. We know that Jesus Christ lives because we have experienced it. Now we must share that experience with the world. The angel in the tomb said, Do not look for the living among the dead. He is risen. You will not find the resurrected Christ in the remains of of some physical evidence or some scientific experiment. Christ is not a dead fact, but a living Savior. 
We know Jesus lives because of all the lives that have been changed because of his presence in their lives. The first disciples became radically changed because of their experience of the resurrected Christ. Our lives have been changed because of our experience of Christ. We are the living proof that Christ lives. So let us go out and live it and share it. Share what we know. Share what we have experienced. Let us have others realize that they too are children of God. Amen.